All right. Well, welcome to the fabulous community that uh, have signed up to do our webinar today, our, our teaching. This is the fourth in a four-part series um, to educate, uh, educate uh, the U.S. population and the peace community to take proactive steps to advocate for peace and diplomacy and no war with North Korea. Um, I'm, my name is Christine Ahn. I'm the International Coordinator of Women Cross DMZ, and I just want to deeply thank um, everybody, the hundreds of people, and actually thousands of people that have joined um, our online teachings all around the world, and, uh, with, and to express my deep gratitude to all the people that, all the experts uh, who have uh, joined us um, in providing expertise and, uh, and their insight. Um, that includes uh, Tim Shorrock, Elena Kim. Um, uh, oh my gosh, I'm having a blank here. Kevin Gray, Linda Lewis, um, Nan Kim. Um, and the last one, Yoshioka from Japan Peace Boat, uh, Che Un Ah from the Korean Alliance of Progressive Movements in South Korea, Hyun Lee for helping to translate, Lee Tae Ho from uh, P People's Solidarity for People's Democracy, and Ji Yun Ya, professor at Northwestern for moderating the last webinar. So here we are, um, and what amazing timing because it actually coincides with actual legislation that is underway in Congress. And uh, we are just incredibly fortunate to have some of the best and the brightest in Washington, DC, who are working um, diligently, tirelessly, and, uh, and are here with us to share their um, incredible expertise and to help us figure out how we advocate most effectively um, for peace, diplomacy, and no war. Um, this is going to be an hour-long webinar. We're going to um, hear uh, from, uh, let's see, from three of our experts. Paul Kavika Martin from Peace Action is going to give us kind of the 101 on how to contact your representatives and how to be really effective in influencing them to advocate for our positions. Um, then we'll hear from Erica Fine from Win Without War, who will uh, tell us about the latest bills. Um, in both the House and the Senate side on a no unconstitutional first strike on North Korea. Then we'll hear from Daniel Jasper from AFSC on proactive steps for engagement that are currently in various uh, pieces of legislation in Congress. And, um, and you know, it's just really important to keep those channels of people-to-people uh, -people engagement open. Um, before I introduce Paul, I'm going to just read a quick email that I received from um, a fabulous woman, Mary Bodan, from uh, Women Act Against Military Madness in St. Paul, Minneapolis. She wrote to say, um, so I just participated in one of their um, teachings at the University of Minnesota Law School, and uh, they have been participating in all the webinars and sharing the YouTube links, which are now available online at the Women Cross DMZ website. So if you missed any of them, they're now all available. Um, and so they've been with us in part of this and, and really um, advocating together. And so this is what she wrote. She said, I'm happy to, to tell you that Congresswoman Betty McCollum, who represents St. Paul, Keith Ellison represents our adjoining twin city of Minneapolis, has signed the Conyers-Markey legislation. The End the War Committee of Women Against Military Madness has had appointments with Minnesota congressional offices to deliver thousands of signatures on petitions to demand that the U.S. sign the international treaty to ban nuclear weapons and has been advocating and will continue to advocate against attacking Korea at the same time. So their organizing and mobilizing really led to a concrete action by their congresswoman to endorse the no unconstitutional first strike bill. So um, that just gave me a lot of hope that uh, what we can do on the ground will make a difference. So, um, so let's get started right away. I'm really honored to introduce Paul Kavika Martin. Um, he is Peace Action Senior Director for Policy and Political Affairs. 
He's been a policy changer and coalition builder with numerous progressive organizations, including Greenpeace and Physicians for Social Responsibility. His work has appeared in all the major US newspapers, including today an op-ed in The Hill, um, TV and radio networks, and many international outlets. Paul uses his expertise on nuclear weapons, international relations, and UN foreign policy to mobilize peace actions, 200,000 supporters to lobby Congress for social change. He has led dozens of extreme, quote unquote, extreme lobbying trainings. And we're so honored that he's here to share with us his, his deep uh, expertise and knowledge. So, Paul. Thanks, Christine. And Peace Action is very proud to have Christine as an advisory board member. She's definitely one of those superhuman organizers and leaders. And I'm so glad to be on with some other excellent leaders like Dan and Erica. Um, so this training that I typically give is can be a couple of hours or a couple of days and we're going to do it in a couple of minutes, which is very exciting. Um, so first of all, what I'm telling you is very general and may not be your delegation. Everyone's congressional delegation, your senators, your house members are different. Um, so be aware that this is kind of in general and you need to take a look at your own situation and how you uh, how you want to deal with your delegation. Uh, remember uh, the lens that you might be looking at um, how to deal with your members of Congress. Um, right now, we're all very excited about a short-term issue, um, a war in North Korea. Uh, but let's not forget the long term. So the, the, these outreaches that you're having to members of Congress and their staff is to hopefully build a long-term relationship. I understand there might be some members who you'll never have a long-term relationship with. That's up to you. But building these relationships and thinking about this as a relationship, relationship building is not only going to help what might happen in the short term in North Korea, but you know the North Korean issue could could be a, a several month ordeal, and you want to build these relationships so you can push your members of Congress on this issue. So, um, how do we influence members of Congress? Each member of Congress is different, and uh, uh, and they are moved by different reasons. And I assume someone will give me a hand signal if you can't hear me and I'll pick up the phone because I can see a little bit of uh, internet, internet uh, buzzing going on there. Um, each member of Congress is different uh, and wh what moves them is different. So you want to take a, try to figure out what moves your member of Congress. So are they in a tight election? That means they're going to be looking more at voters. Um, but maybe it's their clergy that they listen to. Maybe it's the largest employer in their district that they listen to. Um, typically it is, uh, and am I seeing that we're having problems with audio? Am I okay? Okay, great. And um, so there's different ways and you can figure that out. Um, that's something you need to kind of figure out, but constituency um, is certainly a big one. Um, so over and over again, when various foundations take a look at what members of Congress listen to, uh, the biggest thing that they say is actually in-person meetings with constituents. Um, so that is your high bar. Can you put together an in-person meeting with your member of Congress. And most members of Congress are actually home um, Fridays through Mondays. So you can try to catch them on the weekend or there are various recesses. Um, so that is, your, that is your best bet if you wanna have a biggest influence. And that means getting together as many high influential people, broad base in your society to come sit down uh, with your member of Congress or their staff um, and talk about the North Korean issue. Um, your asks, what those asks will be, that's what Erica is going to go over. Uh, but if you could put together that kind of a meeting, you're going to have the most impact probably for that member. It's not the easiest thing to do, but it is the one with the most impact. Moving on down the line, sending emails, uh, making phone calls um, to the offices. Um, and remember, when you do that, you want to make sure you include your The big mistake that people make in phone calls is they uh, make calls without uh, telling their address. And sometimes those calls aren't counted. So make sure that those calls, you tell them your address and that you expect some sort of a written, a written response. Um, other ways that you can influence members of Congress are obviously uh, through the media, um, through social media, uh, by writing op-eds in the districts, making sure you write letters to the editor um, in the district, uh, make sure you're tweeting um, at your member of Congress, um, and then engagement on a one-on-one -on -one level that's not expected, or what some people call guerrilla lobbying, uh, or town halls. You might find out where your member of Congress is going to be and go there and ask him the, 
the tough questions about North Korea, have a conversation with them, have a conversation with their staff. Um, the, the last couple of things I'm, I'm going to say is then share this information back. It's good to have this information back into um, people like myself and Erica or things so we understand what you're hearing from members of Congress so we can try to follow up with whatever arguments they are, they may or may, may not be uh, making. And again, this is a, a long-term relationship building thing, um, developing as many uh, political pressure points, which could be um, you know, who they listen to, which might be their, talking to their wives. Um, it might be finding out who their major donors are through the FEC website and getting their donors to call. I mean, there are many ways that you can put pressure on a member of Congress. Um, so think outside, uh, think, in, think of those ways. I do have an extreme lobbying document um, that I don't really like posted uh, online, but I will try to post a link to it in the chat and people can certainly take a look at that. Um, the last thing I wanna say is you may not know what you do makes a difference, but we hear stories about how these type of actions that you're taking make a difference in the long term. So you might not find out in the next month or two that you made a difference, uh, but I guarantee you the stuff that you do reaching out to your member of Congress can have an impact over the long haul. Thank you so much. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Paul. That was really excellent. And, um, and I think that everything that you said was totally relevant to what we can be doing at this moment. Um, let me introduce Erica Fine. She's the Advocacy Director at Win Without War. In this capacity, she engages with Congress, the Executive Branch, the NGO community, media, and grassroots partners to advance the organization's progressive foreign policy and national security agenda. Her career has centered in and around Congress and foreign policy issues. Previously, she served as the Director of Government, Government Affairs at Women's Action for New Directions, where she led campaigns to limit the excessive US nuclear weapons arsenal. And she served also as a foreign policy and national security legislative assistant to a senior Democrat in the US House of Representatives. So um, Erica, we're really delighted that you're here with us and, um, and working the halls of Congress and so Tell us uh, what we need to know about legislation underway. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Christine, and to all of the viewers that are here. I'm really glad to be on this call with you at such an important moment um, to be able to talk about legislation that's in Congress. I, I first met Christine at a gathering of women working in the peace and security field and her story moved everyone. Um, it moved me and, you know, she is just a tremendous advocate and activist and someone who cares so deeply about striving for a better world. And so uh, I'm very lucky, I feel very lucky to, to know her and, and similarly, very lucky to be on this webinar um, with my fellow panelists who I work closely with in DC. So um, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about the bills that we need to lift up given this current situation. But before I get into specifics, I do want to share a little bit of context. Um, so we all know that the Trump administration has a strategy of being reckless and wanting to keep everyone guessing. But we also need to be clear that they have for months now been calling uh, a, some calling a uh, nuclear armed intercontinental ballistic missile a red line. And most experts on North Korea will tell you that even if there's credible evidence that um, North Korea can miniaturize a warhead to fit on an, on an intercontinental ballistic missile, that that does not constitute a threat so serious that we should initiate a catastrophic war. Um, in fact, someone who has worked on this issue for years, a former uh, top US official uh, and former director of national intelligence, Admiral Blair, said that the Trump administration is, quote, hyping the threat of a nuclear armed ICBM, that it's a self-inflicted policy disadvantage and he further went on to say that it is not a game changer and that we can maintain deterrence with North Korea. Um, do we want North Korea to expand its nuclear capabilities? Of course not. 
But diplomacy, that's where diplomacy comes in. And diplomacy is very, very hard work, but it's the only option that we have if we want to avoid the deaths of millions of people. So also some context, um, the Bush administration used the very idea of possession of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq to uh, launch a preemptive strike on Iraq. So this is not without precedent in the last uh, 20 years. Um, and, you know, just the other day, uh, both Secretary Mattis and Secretary Tillerson went before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and argued that even possession of a, uh, even North Korea's possession of a nuclear weapon could constitute an imminent threat um, that would invoke the president's constitutional power uh, to, to attack North Korea. Now, members of Congress disagree with this, and that is where this legislation comes in. Um, uh, now, um, we, so specifically, um, not only uh, do members of Congress say that we don't have, that the president does not have the legal authority under the Constitution um, or under any laws uh, governed by or uh, promulgated by Congress to attack North Korea short of an imminent threat, but also that Congress will restrict any funds for an unauthorized attack. And so legislation has been introduced in the House by Representative John Conyers um, and Representative Tom Massey of, uh, so Conyers is a Democrat from uh, Detroit, Michigan, and Massey is a Republican from Kentucky. And together with 59 other co-sponsors, original co-sponsors, they introduced HR 4140, the No Unconstitutional Strike Against North Korea Act. And actually, if you bear with me for a second, I am going to try and put a link to the press release in, um, in the ch chat box in this um, that you'll see on the right hand side of your screen so that you can take a look at the press release and um, the bill text if you're interested. Um, now, senators on the uh, thought that this was such a, a great idea that, that they also jumped on the bandwagon. Um, we have Senator Markey who introduced uh, companion legislation which is S2016. And um, you will also note that that is in the press release, the Conyers press release. Um, Senator Murphy also thought that this was such a, uh, an important idea. And he introduced similar but not identical legislation this week, along with Senators Tammy Duckworth, Brian Schatz, Cory Booker, Bernie Sanders, uh, Jeff Merkley, Elizabeth Warren, and Tom Udall. Um, and so in terms of the goals here, I think that they should be twofold. First, I think we want to use these bills as a way to educate members of Congress that aren't on them. So all Democrats um, in particular, I mean, actually at the very least, all Democrats should be supportive of the idea that uh, the just ideologically that the uh, Trump administration doesn't have authority to start a war with now uh, with North Korea without congressional authorization. Um, but at the same time, we also think um, that there is a secondary goal of uh, of bringing Republicans on this legislation as well. And there are Republicans that are genuinely concerned about constitutional overreach by the executive branch, um, but they're also genuinely concerned about Trump's recklessness. Um, we, we've seen Bob Corker, Senator Bob Corker, the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, stating that he is concerned that Trump is going to start World War III. Um, you know, he was the chairman who held this hearing uh, and his members asked questions about North Korea. Uh, I think that he is someone that the, the groups, the grassroots should be constantly 
reaching out to and urging to sign on to this legislation or to introduce his own legislation um, that could basically that could do the same thing or you know su support diplomacy with North Korea anything that will show a unified front in Congress that uh, that they won't stand for you know unilateral presidential action against North Korea um, in terms of the house uh, the other the other so this will get maybe a little bit complicated but um targets in the house you know i think everybody should be on this legislation right but we we have to start somewhere so if you see in the um you can you know take a look now or take a look later but in this conyers press release um he does include two letters at the very end that um have a total of i believe 79 members uh, these were letters that they sent earlier this year to the Trump administration advising diplomacy, advising that they tone down the rhetoric. All of these members of Congress should be on the Conyers legislation. Right now, there are 61 members, so we only need um, 18, 18 more um, to get to that full 79 or so. I, I don't have the exact number. But... Um, but that's a good starting point. The other, another starting point would be to look at all the members of the Congressional Progressive Caucus and uh, note that, um, that not all members of the CPC are on the, the, the legislation. If you aren't sure how to see who is a co-sponsor of a bill, um, you can go to congress.gov and type in the bill numbers that I shared with you earlier. The bill numbers, again, I will read them to you um, in the House, are HR 4140. And in the Senate, we have both uh, S2016, which is the Markey bill. Markey is from Massachusetts. And S2047, which is the Murphy bill. Uh, and Murphy is from Connecticut. Um, Trying to think if there was anything else that I wanted to say. Happy to uh, have more discussion in question and answer, but I think I will leave it there. Thanks. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Erica. It's so great to have you and to have you in Washington, D.C. doing the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Um, our last speaker is Dan Jasper. He's the He's my co-conspirator. Uh, we helped found the Korea Peace Network, and um, so he's become kind of a brother to me. So thank you, Dan, for joining us. He's the Asia Public Education and Advocacy Coordinator for the American Friends Service Committee. His role is to bring lessons learned from AFSC's programs throughout Asia back to policymakers in Washington, D.C. His current work focuses heavily on the humanitarian, peace building, and people-to-people -people elements of US-North Korea relations. So here, Dan is gonna share with us some concrete steps that we can advocate for proactive engagement with North Korea. Thanks, Christine. Uh, I got a timely message from my computer that the internet is unstable. Uh, so let me know if I, uh, if I fall out of communication. Um, so really quick, I, I just want to say, Christine, uh, I got to uh, give you a lot of appreciation for putting this together um, and, and, and thank Women Across DMZ for sort of thinking through this. Um, this is it's a really complicated issue. And for us to have four weeks of fantastic panelists going through these issues um, and, and sorting through some of this stuff is really fantastic. And uh, I, I can't thank you enough for putting this together um, and for allowing me to talk, um, uh, which is great as well. Um, my panelists, my fellow panelists, uh, gave a really great uh, starting point, I think, for the advocacy end of this. Um, and I think before I launch into my spiel, I want to I wanna sort of say that uh, what Erica just sort of talked about is, and what I'll talk about, are, are sort of two different sides of the same coin. Um, Erica is talking about legislation that is more about um, preventing armed conflict with North Korea. Um, there are aspects that are pro uh, diplomacy, of course, um, but what I'll talk about are some of the some of these concrete steps that we can take um, to de-escalate tensions right now. Um, and, and these are sort of smaller steps, but they're important. And, and, and the things that I'll highlight are issues that have advanced far enough 
um, with um, very small um, efforts, I think, um, that they're really sort of at the precipice of being enacted. Um, <clears throat> but we're at the point now where we, we really sort of desperately need grassroots support. Uh, so I also wanna, wanna, wanna thank everybody who's joined us today um, for taking interest in this subject um, and for taking action. Um, we really need your help to transform this conflict. Uh, it's, it's a sticky issue, as Paul said, it might be around for a while. Um, and so we really, the more hands, the more voices we can get, the better. <clears throat> so I, I have the, I think the distinguished honor of being the last panelist uh, in, a, in a long series of experts. Um, so standing on the shoulders of giants here, I want to take a step back really quickly. I'll try to be concise um, and just sort of pull out some lessons that I think that I was hearing um, from some of these webinars previously. The, the first thing that I think I want to highlight really quick is that um, we have instincts um, when it comes to conflicts like this to fall back on, on what we know and what we've understood in the past, which is, which is natural. Um, there's, a, there's a tendency, I think, to compare North Korea to, to Iran or, or China or, or Cuba or West Germany or whatever. Um, but it's important to remember that, you know, conflicts can take an infinite number of forms. Um, and so while on one hand we can learn lessons and we can take tools from past, uh, past uh, conflicts, uh, we can't just sort of pick up um, cookie cutter models of con conflict transformation and plop them down on new conflicts and expect that to work out. Um, we'll hear a lot about uh, the Iran model and how people want to apply the Iran model to North Korea. I think that's it's problematic because you know the U.S. Uh, U.S. Iranian relations didn't develop the same way that U.S. North Korean relations did, um, and we heard a lot about the history um, and why sanctions just don't apply in the case of North Korea in the in the case they did in Iran, and you know representing an organization that uh, that does humanitarian work on the ground, I can tell you that you know North Koreans say we have lived our entire lives under sanctions. Uh, slapping on more is not going to make a noticeable difference to us. And we just don't have uh, any reference point um, beyond being sanctioned. So it, it's become a political solution. It's become a solution that it, it makes it look like Congress is doing something, but in fact, um, it's actually aggravating uh, the situation. And our, our fellow panelist, uh, Paul, um, uh, recently wrote an op-ed in The Hill that was published today uh, talking about that. So I'd Suggest so checking that out. Uh, taking a step back and, and looking at the conflict between the US and North Korea, you know, we dove into the history and past webinars. Um, and I think there's sort of a lot of ways you can dissect this huge chasm that exists between the US and North Korea. Um, but given that we're in sort of lobbying mode right now, I think what's useful is to apply this sort of layered approach. Um, when, I, when I talk to DOD officials, the Department of Defense officials, They'll also often give you sort of a, a three-layered approach to how they see peace being built. Um, and what's stunning is that this isn't really that different from how uh, Quakers, uh, you know, the organization that I represent, really views peace being built. Um, what they'll tell you is that, you know, there's this fundamental layer of humanitarian engagement that usually underlies all, all peaceful interactions between, you know, between countries. Uh, and on top of that is, is built this foundation of military to military cooperation. Uh, it's usually done in running joint drills or, or um, running humanitarian operations together, that kind of stuff. It, it, either way, just having the military cooperate rather than, um, uh, you know, compete. Um, and then on top of that, of course, is the political layer. And when it comes to the U.S. and North Korea, this is, this is the layer of the, the peace treaty, denuclearization, um, that kind of stuff. And, and currently, that is, it's a bit out of reach for us right now. Um, what is within reach, however, is, is this humanitarian gap. It's that human level, the individual to um, individual, to individual level um, that really presents the most opportunities to start pulling things into position where um, political dialogue can take place seriously. Um, I would say that there's probably, there's a multitude of issues that could be addressed at the humanitarian level. Um, that, could, that could serve this purpose. Um, but there's two in particular uh, that I wanna highlight today. Um, and I, I'll highlight them because one, they can provide um, 
a sort of public display of affection between the U.S. and North Korea that could really dial down, back tensions, um, give the political leaders some space that they might need to, to work things out behind the scenes. Um, and, they, and they start to build closure at the individual level. Um, people are still divided by this war that happened 60 years ago, 60 plus years ago. Um, and so starting to address that now um, might help to reconcile the countries more, um, more generally. So these two issues. Um, the first of the, these issues um, is, is, I think, probably one of the most promising. Uh, I'll refer to it as remains for shorthand. Um, what I'm talking about is after the Korean War, there were about 8,000 U.S. servicemen, um, POWs, and MIAs that have been left in North Korea. Um, these were uh, uh, remains, uh, the, they were servicemen that were killed in battle. Some of them were live um, POWs. It's not likely that they're alive anymore, um, but they are still in North Korea. Um, for about a decade, the U.S. and North Korea ran joint operations to find these remains and repatriate them back to the United States. It was a fantastic exercise. I was lauded on both sides. Um, the militaries absolutely loved it because they were cooperating and it was sort of this bellwether um, that they could use to see how relations were going. And as long as they were looking each other in the eyes, they weren't really worried about meeting each other on the battlefield. Um, unfortunately, in 2005, the US pulled out citing security concerns. And this was shortly after the Bush administration um, called or clumped North Korea into the axis of evil. Uh, they pulled out so abruptly that uh, there's still equipment in Pyongyang um, that was being shipped there in, while the U.S. was pulling out. And North Korea has kept this equipment. They haven't even opened the boxes. Um, they've kept it because they want to restart these operations. Um, today, there's about 5,000 of these remains still there. Um, but more crucially, we know that North Korea is actually holding 120 of these remains sort of at the ready um, and, and they're willing to part with them if the United States declares this a humanitarian issue. They feel, North Korea feels, that the United States has politicized this issue. And so what they want is the United States to make a general statement that says this is a humanitarian issue and the United and North Korea will hand over um, either all or, or some of these remains to a third party. So it's very low risk. Um, and, it, and, and then from there, they can start, they can start talking about um, restarting these operations. Very low risk um, and, and holds a lot of opportunity, I think. The second issue um, is, is similar in vain, I think, um, because it's really, it's really getting to divided families. Um, this, this issue uh, is talking about living families, though. Um, after the war, there were about uh, 10 million families that were divided from uh, north and south. Uh, about 100,000 100, uh, Korean families came to the United States after the war that were separated from loved ones uh, in, in the in North. Uh, today, we estimate that there's about 3,000 of them still alive, and we know that there's uh, a number of them interested in reuniting with their loved ones. Uh, in the past, this, this wasn't actually an issue. Uh, uh, Korean Americans could actually go to North Korea and reunite with their, their family members if they could find them. Um, that wasn't really an issue. North Korea allowed it, no problem. Um, but unfortunately, due to the, the deteriorating security concerns and now the travel restrictions put into place by the United States, um, these families are looking for a little government facilitation on this. Um, you may have seen uh, North Korea and South Korea do uh, large scale family reunions. Um, this, has never, this has never happened between the United States and South Korea, um, but it could. Um, and it would be useful probably to run sort of a pilot exercise. And so a lot of these families and, and, and a segment of the Korean American community are really asking the government uh, uh, to step it up, to, to work with the Red Cross, to find um, matches for family members that are wanting to reunite with loved ones, and then to make it happen. Uh, and, and really they have a lot of rights uh, to ask for this for the U.S. government because the U.S. government has obligations under, under the uh, Geneva Conventions uh, to facilitate at the bare minimum communication between these families uh, and ideally uh, facilitate reunions between these families. Um, so those, those are the issues in brief, uh, and I'm being very concise here. Uh, taking action on these issues 
uh, is, is a little bit difficult, but we're going to make this really, really easy for everybody on the webinar. Don't worry too much about the technicalities of what I'm going to talk about here because uh, we're going to follow up with a lot of information that will sort of make it really easy for you guys. Um, what we're looking for right now, since the administration could take action on these issues at any moment if they wanted to, um, they certainly know how we feel about this. But now we need Congress uh, to raise the profile of these issues and to hold the administration accountable. Why aren't, the, why aren't they restarting operations to bring these remains home? There's 120 at the door, and these families are now wondering, you know, why aren't we bringing these people back? They, they've been waiting decades to get their father or their uncle or their cousin back to the United States. Here they are at the doorstep, and the U.S. isn't doing anything about it. So, the Cong so Congress really needs to hold the administration accountable. What we're looking for is an amendment to a specific act. It's called the North Korea Human Rights Reauthorization Act. It's going through Congress right now. We're looking for what's called reporting requirements. Um, that would be uh, essentially Congress telling the State Department to report back, how are they gonna bring back these remains? What are their plans to make reunions happen, uh, et cetera. Um, there's essentially three ways, I think, that you could take action on these issues. Uh, and again, um, you, you know, we'll, we'll make it really easy for you. Everybody on this webinar will receive an email around or on November 10th. Um, with the follow-up action on this. Uh, it'll be click to call. Um, it, it'll probably focus on a few senators. We'll probably focus in on two to four senators um, who are really the sort of bottleneck for this issue right now. Um, we, all the heavy lifting has been done around this. It's actually, this issue is actually passed the House, uh, but the Senate has not uh, taken action on any of it. Uh, so we'll send an email. Uh, it'll be click to call. You'll just click a button and it'll direct you to uh, the senator's office. It'll provide a script. It'll remind you of the issues and it'll be super simple. It'll take probably four to eight minutes of your time. Uh, and so any action there would be really, really appreciated. Uh, another way would be to just bring this up in conversations that you have with your representative's office or your senator's office. You can raise this generally if you can't remember the technical details. You can say, what are you doing to hold the administration accountable to make reunions happen for Korean American families? What are you doing to repatriate the remains of U.S. servicemen left in North Korea? Um, make them answer these questions. That's part of, of this advocacy effort is doing a lot of education around this because frankly, uh, not a lot of members of Congress are, are, are fully aware of these issues. Uh, and the last one uh, is to stay engaged. Um, at all levels of the conflict transformation process. You know, again, Paul mentioned that this is gonna be a long process. Um, the reconciliation of a division that has taken place over six decades is gonna take a lot of time and energy. There's not one singular nuclear deal that's gonna fix everything between the US and North Korea. It's gonna take a lot of effort around the edges, a lot of people to people connections. Um, and there's a lot of issues out there, I think that are, are, are sort of ready for the taking um, that we'll be pushing over the next year or so. And so you can stay engaged and help us, help us advocate for these things. Um, the easiest way to do that is to check AFSC's website or webpage, uh, afsc.org backslash engage NK. Uh, and we'll have an action up there at all times that you can take and uh, information on these issues. Uh, and I'll drop that link in the chat box as well. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll stop there and uh, leave plenty of time for questions. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Dan. That was really, really interesting. And thank you to Erica and to Paul. Um, and also thank you to Jacqueline, who has been um, on all these webinars and working all the back end to make sure they are all smooth and, and then uplo uploading them to YouTube so that they can be a resource. Um, so now I think we're going to take some questions from um, the people that are um, on the webinar. And I don't know, Jacqueline, if you can also check to see on the Facebook um, feed to see if there are any questions from there. Um, but uh, the first question is um, from Mindy Mesmer to all the panelists. Do you have any idea why Dems in Congress are not signing on to the, I imagine the Marky Lou bill? which is kind of related to North Korea, but mostly focused on a no nuclear first strike. I think, yeah, so I, I can take a stab at it. Um, and then also keep the floor for a second because I have a couple other things that I wanted to say. Um, 
Uh, so we're talking about HR 669, I believe, which is um, the no, no first, uh, I can't remember the actual name of the bill because it's confusing with the North Korea uh, legislation now in my head, but it would prevent Congress from, it would prevent uh, any president from launching a nuclear first strike without congressional authorization. I think um, in the same way that, you know, members of Congress need to be educated about the threat uh, that we face with a war with North Korea. Um, they need to be, they need to be educated about what nuclear launch authority actually is. Um, the president, the nuclear weapons system was designed in such a way that the president has absolute authority over the launch of nuclear weapons. And I don't, it's not clear to me that all members of Congress, including all Democrats in Congress, know that. Um, I'll also be honest that I think that, you know, uh, nuclear weapons are a, you know, unique and uh, special kind of weapon. And I don't say that with any um, positive value attached to it, but um, there is sort of this, 70 year long belief that maybe the president should have that kind of authority, even, even this president. And so it's our duty to, uh, to, to change their minds. Um, and it's, it's not an easy process, but certainly uh, is, is, is well worth it in this instance. Um, when we're talking about the threat of war with North Korea, but also just generally the threat of nuclear weapons use. Um, if I could just hold the floor for one other second. So I also just wanted to mention that Win Without War will have opportunities to specifically weigh in with members of Congress on the House and Senate bills. Um, so if you are interested, sign up for uh, at winwithoutwar.org and join our listserv and you can receive action alerts from us. Um, and then the second thing that I wanted to say is that there will be a press conference tomorrow and I'm going to share the link with you right now so that you can watch it because it will be live streamed. Um, there will be a press conference tomorrow at 1130 Eastern time um, with both the House and Senate champions of the um, nuclear, of the North Korea war prevention work that they're doing. So uh, hopefully you will have time to tune in there. You may see me in the background holding up a sign. Great, thank you so much, Erica. Did um, Paul want to say anything about um, mm -hmm. why more Dems haven't signed on to the Marky Lou bill? Sure, Erica ha has it right. But one thing I, I want to say, especially for Democrats, under the Trump administration, uh, many staff are just actually completely overwhelmed, especially on the foreign policy side. Just remember what's been going on mm -hmm. in the Trump administration. You had you know, Syria, Niger, North Korea, Iran, nuclear weapons. Um, and so, especially on the House side where many staff might have foreign policy and tax and, and something else, um, just staying on top of things has been very difficult. So it may not be anything that it just hasn't, right, you know, gotten onto the plate of the of the staffer. So, you know, constant emails or calls to the staff, it might be helpful to make sure that they've seen it and, and try to, you know, bubble it up to the top of their huge stack. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question from Michael Eisenscher from um, U.S. Labor Against War. Any approach to Jimmy Carter about leading a humanitarian uh, delegation to North Korea? Maybe Dan, do you know anything about this? Uh, well, we actually have a, approached Jimmy Carter in the past um, for speaking engagements and things like that. Um, currently, I'll, I'll say this, um, there's been proposals floated for, for high-level delegations, not necessarily with Jimmy Carter involved, although he did um, sort of publicly ask Trump to send him. Um, it, it's been difficult, uh, I think, because you got to get um, you got to get a nod uh, to be successful in this high-level humanitarian delegations. Got to get a nod from both sides. Um, and right now, um, it's not necessarily that everybody is giving a red light. It's that um, things are going unanswered to some extent. Um, and so that people are sort of uh, holding these types of things as cards to play at the right time. And, and the same goes for, for the issues that I just discussed. 
Um, so, you know, there's there's uh, things in the works and that are that are trying to to take place, uh, but it's going to take some time, and uh, we'll, we'll see how things play out. I guess. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, there aren't other questions, but um, I certainly have some questions to ask. Um, so we know that so. And this is where I'm like the furthest away from Washington, D.C., so I'm not following the debates. But um, one issue is about, you know, obviously now this, there's a whole conversation, especially with this you no know, unconstitutional first strike on North Korea, about the authorization to use military force. And I recall Barbara Lee had uh, spoken in Congress earlier this year and, and even got the Republicans, I think, to all stand up and, and give her a standing ovation for her courageous leadership to... Um, to vote against uh, the authorization to use military force against Iraq. Um, I'm just wondering where is that conversation uh, on Capitol Hill? Is, uh, is the North Korea issue um, really going to push Congress to, um, to change, change the, the kind of precedent that the, that the Bush administration laid? And that is now basically, I mean, what is happening? We know that there was the Madison Tillerson um, hearing the other day where they seem to think that they have the right to, uh, to use military force without going to Congress. So I don't know, could, could the three of you help shine a little light on what's happening in terms of the conversation in Washington, DC? Uh, I'm yes, sure. I'm uh, I'm happy to weigh in. I am somewhat skeptical. Uh, so, so just a few things. The 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 so Congresswoman Barbara Lee voted against the was the only member of Congress to vote against the 2001 authorization for use of military force, which has provided um, basically unlimited authority to wage war around, or at least provided a justification for both the Bush and Obama administrations to wage um, unlimited war around the, around the, uh, around the globe um, in the name of, of fighting terrorism. And um, I don't see, I see that the kind of questions about executive branch authority um, are, are, bubbling to the surface. Um, we, so the, the, what happened this year with Barbara Lee was that uh, she had an amendment that was um, agreed upon in a committee and it was going to go to the floor and in, in the middle of the night, the uh, amendment that was passed was stripped out and uh, they were no longer able to vote on the bill with her amendment in it. And so, I think we're seeing a lot of pushback on both the House and Senate side um, from rank and file members who believe that Congress should be debating war and peace issues. Um, and I think including getting clarification from the executive branch about its authorities related to North Korea, related to nuclear launch, um, related to uh, what it's doing in Niger. Um, so all of these things, but and I, and I think we are seeing that, you know, there, there are proposals on the table, um, especially in the Senate. Uh, Senator Kane and Senator Flake have a, have a, le a legislation and, um, that would be a new authorization for use of military force. But there is where we have to be really, really careful. Um, because, you know, I think the very last thing we want is for, on, on North Korea, is for Congress to issue an AUMF. Uh, it, it did it did so on Afghan you know after the after 9/11 it did so in the lead up to the Iraq war that is not what we want in this case so it's great that they're talking about it but you know we would never we would never want that did Paul or Dan have anything else you wanted to add to that or I think Erica did a pretty good job summing that up let me just uh, I would just add a couple of things. As Erica said, you know, all the military action that we're seeing are is thinly based on the authorizations that were given after 9-11 and for the Iraq war, those two AUMFs. Uh, remember, 
and that's the Bush administration used that for all kinds of activities, as did the Obama administration. One difference is the Obama administration at some point uh, during the debate on Syria came and actually asked Congress for a, na a new AUMF. So the administration said, I want you, Congress, to give us a new AUMF. And Congress could not figure out how to do that. Now, we should pat almost all of us on the back for that, because you know why that happened was our work on the Iraq war. You remember the Iraq war, everyone supported that. We turned that against people, or it was a political, end up being a political, uh, 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 something. This is why Trump lies about it, right? Um, this is, you know, you can argue why Obama got elected. He voted against it, Hillary did not. Um, so we made it difficult now for people to vote for war, and so they, they've stopped voting for war, and that's what an AUMF would be. Um, Eric is also right, we're, you know, Peace Action is probably not gonna support any AUMF that Congress is gonna bring up, but if we think that they should, that way we can have the debate, and we can look at at least trying to minimize what we already have, which is this endless blank, blank check for war. Um, sunset clauses, uh, geographical scope, uh, you know, naming the exact targets, you know, let's narrow this down if we're gonna have an AUMF. Uh, the challenge right now is it's a Gordian knot. You have Democrats and Republicans who just cannot agree on what a new AUMF would look like. Um, I know that one of the last debates that happened in the Senate between uh, uh, Senator McCain um, and other senators, they really tried to figure out how to move forward with a new AUMF, and they spent hours talking, senators and staff, and could not figure out a way forward. Uh, but our pressure could perhaps make it so if they do do a new one, it would be limited in scope. And we have to push on Congress to take back this blank, you know, this endless war blank check. So it is a good thing to be thinking about and talking about, I think. Fabulous. Um, one thing I did realize was um, we have, you know, hundreds of people that signed on to the webinars and also joined um, via live Facebook. And so I actually think that maybe I'll compile all the, um, the, the bills and the, the asks and send them out to everybody who participated just this one time without having to bombard them with emails. But just to, um, I mean, we obviously had a dedicated audience that felt compelled to both listen in and, and hopefully now feel compelled to take action. But um, we have about, oh, seven minutes left. Do you guys um, want to, we don't have any more questions. So I'm just wondering if there were some um, closing Christine, remarks. Sorry. Yeah, Dan. Really quickly, I'm seeing some questions come in. Oh, you are? Oh, I'm not seeing them. Okay, do you want to read them? I'm not seeing them. Um, they're in the Q&A here. Oh, okay, here, there, there's one I see. Um, there is a brewing anti-war movement such as UNAC, which seems to be more protest oriented. How much weight do you folks give to protests versus congressional acts that are you, you are initiating? How do you see the relation between the two, protests and lobbying? What is UNAC? Anybody? Okay. So I guess the question is um, about taking to the streets and protesting versus um, more of a congressional strategy. Well, I'll, I'll mention that because it is a congressional strategy. Um, and, you know, in seven minutes, I couldn't give you everything you can do, a member of Congress. And I talked about building relationships, but there are certain members, it's just difficult to build relationships. And there's some, you know, there's sometimes you have to give tough love to your friends. And the protest could be the tough love. Um, but remember, we are groups who are saying we want diplomacy with North Korea, and I take that with our members of Congress. So the first step is you need to be reaching out. You should be ha trying to have a conversation. And when you get to a point where the you, there is no conversation, remember Congress doesn't do anything, then of course, protests outside their office. We've done sit-ins at their offices, you know, uh, uh, protest in the DC offices, protest in, the, in wherever they're going. Um, obviously those are things that have put certainly put pressure on members of Congress and the administration. We are now just learning from history um, exactly how much protest did affect uh, President Johnson and President Nixon around, uh, around uh, Vietnam. So protest is certainly one of the tactics that we should be thinking about doing when it's appropriate in the right strategic thinking. That's great. Um, Erica and Dan, did you have a response to that? 
No, I, I agree with what Paul said. It's definitely both and uh, protests uh, so that your, your members of Congress know that these are issues that you care about. It's great. Um, yeah. There was an yeah, go ahead, Dan. Uh, oh, I was just going to say, yeah, I mean, it's critical that there's a visible aspect of all this. Um, there, there's a problem, I think, when uh, strategies are too lobby oriented uh, and uh, it, because it, it takes it out of the public view, um, which uh, fails to hold these uh, these policymakers accountable for these actions. So that it has to be both. In that. I would agree with that. Um, so there was a question and uh, Erica quickly responded, but let me just read it out loud here. It's um, uh, from Maureen. The question is, um, can anyone explain the difference between the Markey bill and the Murphy bill? I noticed the Murphy bill has more co-sponsors. Is it because the language isn't as strong? And Erica responded, my suggestion is work on senators that haven't co-sponsored either bill. But do you wanna quickly um, elaborate on that, Erica? Um, well, I was actually answering the question from Maureen that if our if our senator has jumped on to co-sponsor one of the bills, should we still press him to co-sponsor the other? Okay. And my response is uh, is is no. I mean, I think you know get is these are these are similar pieces of legislation that um, you know if they feel compelled to join one of them, I think that that at, at the end of the day, what we're looking for is a strong unified message that uh you know that 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 says that the president must come to congress before he contemplates striking north korea great but just to add to that is there are other things you can ask members of congress to do we've been very focused here on this piece of legislation because that's you know voting and supporting legislation is like the biggest thing that one of the biggest things members can do but if they're already on you can ask them to become more of a leader you can ask them to help with the legislation you can ask them to make a floor statement you can ask them to write an op-ed you can ask them to write a letter to the administration. There are many things that members of Congress do besides legislative thing, things, and even our champions need a, sometimes a push to, 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 be, to do more because they're being pushed by other people on other issues. Um, so even if they're already on a bill, doesn't mean that you can't push them to do more um, on the issue. Can, can I also just really quickly add to that? Um, it, don't forget about the, these humanitarian issues. Um, Erica mentioned before the, the letters to Trump from the Democrats in the House. Uh, the, that letter actually contained both of these issues that I mentioned. Um, and the, the response that the White House gave to, to the authors of that, uh, to that letter uh, didn't include a response to the remains and reunions. And I am fairly certain that is because they don't want people to know where they are with these issues. And so we have to keep pressing them and hold them accountable for these issues. And one public display of affection could turn this thing around right now. So please, please do not underestimate those things. Mm -hmm. That's and, really great. And yeah, similarly, Erica. And similarly, um, we are also very focused on these sort of war prevention pieces of legislation, but you know, I think all, you know, I'll just speak with, for Women Without War, we strongly support pushing members of Congress to be vocal about um, diplomacy with North Korea. And, and, uh, and like, that is, I think, our long-term ask. And when we're in these sort of crisis moments, I think these bills raise public awareness in a way that sort of just pushing for diplomacy um, can't do, unfortunately, but that is, that is not to say that that is not a key core ask um, that we have. And in fact, you know, the Conyers, um, the Conyers Markey companion legislation has a provision in it. Um, it is a sense of Congress statement uh, that says that um, the Trump administration should pursue uh, diplomacy. Um, I'm trying to see if if I can find, uh, it, it, it says a sense of Congress that a conflict on the Korean Peninsula, Peninsula would have catastrophic consequences for the American people, members of the U.S. Armed Forces in the region, U.S. interests, U.S. allies, South Korea and Japan, the long-suffering people of North Korea, and global peace and security more broadly. And then it goes on to encourage the president to take steps 
to engage in negotiations. So um, we talked about the differences. Um, you know, I think they're stylistically different bills in that one of them specifically calls for diplomacy while the other one focuses solely on uh, no, you know, no presidential authority for launching a, an attack. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, Mindy wrote, I love the diplomacy aspect and, and I would agree. And uh, it, I just think it's great that we have um, members of the Senate and on the House side that are willing to speak up and, and really reflect the will of the people. We have seen polls after polls show that 68, at least 68% of the American um, population opposes any kind of military action and that wants to see diplomacy um, used as the first step. And so I think this is our moment to just make very clear to the Trump administration that um, not only is there uh, widespread public support for diplomacy and, and no military intervention, but at least there are members of Congress that would oppose that. Um, so we know that Donald Trump is heading to Asia. Uh, I think he's stopping in Hawaii tomorrow. Um, oh, okay. Do we have do we have time for one last question? Uh, uh, this came from Nan Kim. Is it possible to reframe the language surrounding this legislation? Current language ends up sounding pro-war, escalating, not anti-war, de-escalating, given that it risks taking a first strike on North Korea as a given, granted, inevitable. This is how the press advisory reads, press conference to demand congressional authorization before a first strike on North Korea. This seriously risks sending the wrong message even though it's intended to support diplomacy. I think that's really an astute observation. So um, any quick responses from Erica, Paul, Dan? Uh, certainly we are not framing it in that way. And I, I agree with you. Um, and I will definitely share that with the, the folks that I work with in, in each of these offices. Um, to ask them to 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 reframe, because um, you know we we do not want to suggest that there is that that a strike it should be seen as a possibility. Right, Paul or Dan. Eric said it perfectly. There was a there was a question about the November eleventh action. So if someone could summarize those, that might be helpful. Okay, I didn't see it so. I'm not seeing all the questions. It just asked to, so if you could just summarize what's going on around November 11th, it might be helpful for folks. Yes, um, so, so we know that we launched this um, teach -in, online teaching series to get people educated and mobilized to take action. And that means anything. It means um, participating in these teachings. It means organizing your own. Um, obviously, all the various speakers on, the, on this webinar and past webinars are very knowledgeable about the issues, about the need for diplomacy and peace with North Korea. So you can contact uh, I, I, any of these organizations, you can contact Info at Women Cross CMC. We would be happy to connect uh, your organization, your community group to any of these speakers to provide some knowledge and expertise and, and calls for action. Um, but there are protests that are being planned. There are um, visits to uh, members of Congress calling for um, both their uh, endorsement of these legislations, but also to call for diplomacy and, and humanitarian people-to-people -people engagement. Um, and on November 11th, there will be um, uh, organized by Veterans for Peace and, and supported by other grassroots and national peace organizations, um, a protest to call for peace with North Korea, no military um, action against North Korea. And uh, at the United for Peace and Justice website is, uh, I need to find the link. Let me um, find that in the interim. Um, there have been uh, organizations all across the country that have been posting actions. So you could go to that uh, website. It has a map and you can type in your zip code. You could look for the closest action. So um, it was a call from many organizations to have coordinated action. And some will be in the form, as Erica said, there will be uh, a, an email that will come from Win Without War asking for um, you to call members of Congress, urging them to support this legislation. There will be an ask from, uh, from AFSC calling for us to make phone calls to urge, uh, you know, 
for this uh, reauthorization on North Korea Human Rights Act um, to include language about uh, remains and reunions. Um, so I don't know if you guys want to chime in anything else um, about some of the actions that uh, people are calling for across the country. And, and obviously um, in South Korea and in Japan, they will be having massive protests. I'm not sure how much the scale of Japan, but um, definitely in South Korea for a week, but especially November 4th, because that's when South Koreans like to take to the streets. It's on a weekend. It's when people don't work. Um, there will be massive protests. And obviously on the 7th, when Donald Trump will be speaking to the National Assembly. Um, so any final words from this fabulous uh, panelist? No, final. other than just thank you so much for tuning in. It really means a lot that there's so many people that are engaged. Yes, thank you. Oh, and one last thing there was, thank you, David, for sending this. There's also um, a People's Peace Treaty that uh, is being, um, uh, that was set up by several organizations, but uh, Veterans for Peace, and it's on the um, um, Beyond War, I think, or World, World Without War website. Um, and uh, it is, I think there's about 15,000 signatures already in a matter of a few days. People, basically the American people declaring to the people of North Korea that um, we want to end the Korean War. Um, anything else before we wrap up? Just a, a really big thank you to Christine and Women Across DMZ, Jacqueline Wells, who I don't think anybody's seen, but is making all of this happen behind behind the scenes. Um, really, a lot of appreciation for putting this together, and thank you oh. for all the the, the watchers and, and uh, listeners out there. Yes, absolutely, and thank you. I just feel like we're just um, we're like practicing our muscles. We're building uh, better alliances and working better, better as an as a anti-war and peace movement. It's really heartening. And so I just want to deeply thank all the panelists, all the organizations that have been um, on the front lines calling for peace and diplomacy and no war and, and all the panelists. And I mean, all the people who have been joining the webinars and, and just showing your solidarity and taking action. We have to, we have to both end the Korean War. We have to see peace between the US and North Korea. And I think we're on our way. So thank you very much, everybody. And I'll make sure to uh, collate all the information and send it out to all the webinar participants, which there are hundreds. So thank you for joining us. Thank Thanks. you, Christine. Okay. All the listeners. Okay, bye-bye.